say, tickle your bum with a feather, and if they uh, reply positively, that means they're interested in that I take them back to my place. If they don't reply positively, then I just take myself as saying, I'll be nasty weather. And almost then says, uh, okay, well, that's a good prank, I'll try that sometime. So the first man gets off at a stop, and another attractive female gets on, and the homeless man um, catches the female's eye and says, Tickle your arse with a feather? And the female replies by stating, Uh, what? And the homeless man says, Ah, look at those freaking clouds. And that's the joke. Uh, Crypt Sim Network on that one. Uh, good channel. Check out his pub talks on there. And that's it. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching. And I hope you have a good rest of the day. This is my last video for a while. Um, I just want everyone to realize that um, if you're wondering about August and why there's no holiday to celebrate August, you have New Year's for January and Valentine's for February and St. Patrick's Day for March and so on and so forth. Well, there is a holiday in August that you can celebrate, and that is Left Handed Day. So even if you're not left handed, um, you have a holiday to celebrate. You can celebrate all the left handers out there. Um, I've been left handed for 10 years now, almost 11 actually. I think in November of this year, it will be 11 years. Yeah, 11 years. Um, so that's a holiday for August. It's August 15th. Um, this is a Sunday this year, but want to celebrate it on the 12th or even the 11th. I think that'd be cool too. Um, so yeah, just a holiday, another holiday in the middle year of holidays. Where well, I think it's a good one. Um, so yeah, um, that's it for YouTube videos for a while. Again, I think I'm going to wait until I have a house of my own to make some more because I'm currently in an apartment and I don't want to make too much noise and bother other people. Um, but that's it. Um, thank you for listening, and I hope you have a good rest of the day. Uh, thank you for watching, too, obviously. Um, feel free to like and subscribe. Feel free to leave a comment. And that's it. Uh, thank you again, and have a good rest of the day. So this is going to be the last few set of videos for a while. Um, I live in an apartment, so I can't do too many videos because I don't want to make uh, too much noise with a lot of people. So maybe when I have a house of my own someday, um, I will make some more. Uh, that's my goal right now. But I'll make a few more. Um, I have my parents' house right now, um, just for today, um, but, uh, there's a film that I really would like to see made, which Bob Odenkirk mentions in an interview, which I read about online. He states that it would be interesting to see Saul break out of prison. I'll put spoiler alerts in the uh, description. But, um, I think that'd be a cool movie. Um, I really like the Saul Goodman character. Um, I would like how his character, uh, again, spoiler alert, admitted all of his wrongdoings at the end of the series, took his punishment like a man, and was sent to 87 years in prison. Um, but, you know, prison isn't too bad for him because he helped out a lot of, uh, convicts who are in there, so it would be, uh, 
not extra room for the next year respect self for uh, defending them and their cohorts in the past. So, um, I thought that was a good way to end the series. Um, really would like to see a film where uh, Rhea Seahorn's character, uh, kind of like blanking on the name, but uh, her character helps Saul escape from prison. I think that'd be really cool. Um, so yeah, that's it for that. Uh, Saw the Winter Winter series. I talked about this film a little bit in another video. Um, but uh, yeah, I have some uh, Ben Craft animated shorts um, with him, with me as him on the site also. If you want to check those out. I just really like this series, so I'm just paying homage to that. Um, but that's it for that video, or this video. Um, if you like to leave a comment, feel free. If you want to like and subscribe, feel free. And that's it. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a good rest of the day. So I decided to make another video on the franchise that I really like. That here on the old swim way back in 2003. Uh, the Venture Brothers. So the series is huge now. The movie uh, was released uh, relatively recently. Um, I'm trying to remember the title. It's something to do uh, with the radiant blood of the Babylon Park. Um, I want to see that. Um, so, uh, let's 
good. I have a uh, smooth trailer. Uh, seems like it's uh, consistent in terms of uh, quality with the rest of the series, so that's good. Um, but yeah, I really like the series. Um, I, I really enjoy watching it because um, they really do stick with this concept of, from what I've seen in interviews with the creators, um, Jackson Public and Doc Samson, um, this idea of failure um, among males and coping with failure and dealing with um, consequences of failure and rebounding from it. And I just really enjoy this series. Uh, it has a lot of good uh, pop culture references, a lot of uh, science fiction and comic book references to superheroes and has a really good um, scientific mindset to it um, based off of uh, the Johnny uh, Quest series in the 1960s. I think they were originally trying to parody that series. Um, if you haven't seen that, I'll look it up. Um, I don't know if it's on YouTube or not, but it, it uh, probably has some clips, but it's a really good uh, show from the 60s, it's a cartoon, um, showcasing the boy adventurer Johnny Quest, and it started off as a parody of that, but it evolved into a more complex story, um, which included uh, various characters. Um, Including Dr. Venture, Venture Brothers, Brock Samson, the, um, the bodyguard for the boys, as well as a lot of different villains, the monarch, which is the main villain, and as well as a ton of other ones. Um, and I really like the uh, evolution of the mission. God, I forget his number right now, but. Um, He's the uh, chubby one at first. He is um, one of uh, the monarchs, henchmen. Uh, not super good, uh, not super bad, sort of in the middle in terms of rank. He uh, was picked up by the monarch when he was 15. But he eventually uh, built himself into this really strong. Um, super henchman who even rivals uh, Brock uh, Samson at a certain point and uh, Brock even says he's a decent challenge um, he's not able to beat Brock but uh, he does build himself up to uh, a good challenge for him uh, so yeah that's uh, my discussion of the Venture Brothers I, I really looking forward to the film and if you haven't seen it definitely uh, check it out on YouTube and um, it's there's a bunch of different episodes on there it originally aired on Adult Swim uh, way back in 2003 um, very popular series now and um, it's great uh, really good and I would definitely recommend it to anybody who is curious about it. And that's it. Okay, uh, thank you for listening. I hope you have a good rest of the day. Feel free to like and subscribe. Feel free to comment. And that's it. Thanks again for watching, listening, and watching. And I hope you have a good rest of the day. This is a video on filmstarrunner.com. Filmstarrunner.com um, is a website that still exists, um, and they have a lot of the content on YouTube now. But when it first emerged back in 2000, it was just a strange uh, website based off the children's book by Matt and Mike Chapman. The site featured some strange looking characters um, who are set in 
Uh, three country USA, this one made up. Uh, town in the US. Um, but yeah, the characters are a bit strange. Um, I think they're just based off of um, certain aspects of the brother's childhood. Um, Homestar Runner is based off of something with the, something that his friend said one day about a baseball player that athletes a real Homestar Runner, just something he thought of and said off the top of his head. Strong Dead, um, probably the most popular character on the website, is based off of a character from an NES wrestling game. And yeah, it's, uh, over time the characters sort of evolved. Every um, some different flash cartoons. Um, let me pull my one. I'm going to plug my laptop in here. Um, the original series has some uh, flash, which looks a bit more primitive now, but for the time it was good, um, based off of uh, you know people who are just starting out and doing um, their best to create something unique. Uh, but the Flash, uh, the art has improved over time. The uh, art for the Flash program that they use for the cartoons has improved a lot over time. And the site has really evolved. So it went from these sort of weird uh, Flash cartoons based off of the children's book that they made, and sort of weird sort of character interactions, some uh, references to pop culture in there. There's nothing really political or... Um, well, they do include some scientific references and some academic references in their work, but um, it's more of a social commentary, not anything super political or anything like that. They don't do like political commentary or anything like that, but um, they have a lot of um, pop culture references in their cartoons between these strange characters. Um, the site really has evolved. The character interactions are more complex. Um, they're more... Um, suited to the time. I think they're always suited to the time, but as time progresses, the characters have also fit that, which is good. Um, the voice acting is definitely better than it was back in 2000. Um, and the brothers have done a lot of stuff with the site. They've made a CD based off of the site. Um, they made their own toys and t-shirts and um, video games. Uh, they have a bunch of video games that they made. Um, uh, Bit Electrics, I guess, is their company. Um, they have obviously a bunch of games. Um, not obviously, but they have a bunch of games on their site. They also have a game for the week that they made, um, which is really good. I remember playing that when it came out in 2008 or 2009, something like that. When the original league. <laughs> And I don't see an actual game comes from that week on the other site. But I do respect that they have some real games, uh, and uh, they're all based off the characters and characters who have um, turned into other, other characters at certain points, and um, it's just really cool. There's maybe it's a huge uh, nerd gap, but they never want to check the site out because there's a bunch of Easter eggs you can find as you scroll through. Some of the text uh, on the strong bed emails from one of the characters checks emails and then comments and you can see cartoons about them. Um, so if you scroll through or you put, scroll your mouse cursor over the text, you can sometimes find a secret word where the mouse arrow will turn into a finger and then if you click on the word after the mouse arrow turns into a finger, either a special cartoon will come up or a special picture or text um, that relates to the word. Um, it's just sort of uh, funny or, or strange. There's a bunch of those on the site. I think I spent hours looking through all the strong by emails just to find those little Easter egg cartoons. That's the main component of the site which I really like is the Easter eggs. Um, you can find them in the strong by emails and the text. You can also find them in the cartoons. If you scroll your mouse over a certain character, it will turn into a finger. Then you click on the character. Um, you'll see like a bonus video at the end that they. Um, Another character, or a, just a secret character, will emerge, um, and um, they can find those in the games also. I think I don't quote me on that, but I think there are those in the games too. Um, yes, there are because in the newest, uh, well, not the newest Halloween game, but actually, it is the newest Halloween game. So again, don't quote me on this, but I think you can find Easter eggs in 
and at least one of the games is also open. Just a really cool site. Um, they have, uh, I really like how they do um, Halloween costume commentary. So people dress up as the characters from the site. The characters aren't really weird. Like the main character, Homestar Runner, is like pale and white and he doesn't have any arms. And there's a strong man, it's like this Mexican wrestler. And there's this pom pom character who's just this giant, like orange essentially. And he has these stubby little arms and legs and this uh, weird head. I guess he wouldn't be an orange, I guess his body's yellow, so it's a giant, like, uh, ball, yellow ball with these stubby little arms and legs, and then, like, a weird head, too, which is about, about the same size as the arms and legs, maybe a bit bigger. But anyway, they're all really weird, um, but a um, really enjoyable site to visit if you haven't visited it. Uh, a lot of people probably know more about it now, 2023, but. Um, I think I was probably one of the first, I definitely wasn't the first visitor to the site, but I first started using it back in 2000, um, uh, but in 2003, I first started visiting, rather, um, the site. Um, one of the people that I trained with at my karate dojo, um, just mentioned it one day, and so I checked that, I just became obsessed with it. For a while, like I, I probably from high school until college, and then they took hiatus for a while. But they started making more cartoons again recently. I started watching them again. Um, you know, it's a maybe a bit mature for me to watch them now because I'm a bit older. But I think their cartoons are really good still. Um, and yeah, I recommend it still. But HomestarRunner.com, check it out if you haven't. Um, yeah, I really enjoy it. Um. Easter eggs are definitely the main uh, component of this site, which um, I respect because it probably takes a lot of work to put those Easter eggs in, and uh, I really enjoy that part of the site. Um, we all like when in a video game you find like, a secret character or a secret weapon or just some sort of secret thing that you uncover that uh, makes you feel like you did something special. Um, which you might. Uh, you might have put effort in that, I really don't know, but it cheated also a bit. Um, but yeah, it is a really cool site, and um, definitely check it out, um, or check it. And yeah, never end the sentence with a preposition. Um, I don't know why that is, um, but that's what I was told, so I don't know, maybe I'll start doing that more in the future. But anyway, thanks for listening and watching. Feel free to like and subscribe. Feel free to comment, and have a good rest of the day. So, I mentioned this in the uh, description for the Star Trek uh, Ghostbusters crossover. I mainly talked about Ghostbusters in that video, and I left a comment saying that um, Star Trek would be involved. Um, it would be characters set even before the original series when the Star Trek organization was first starting out. And those would be the characters terraforming the moon. So Star Trek would be this organization um, who starts to terraform the moon. Maybe they're a subsidiary of NASA. Um, so similar to Firefly, uh, who has a Blue Ghost probe, uh, not probe, Lunar Lander, by, by the way. But anyway, those would be the characters on the moon. Um, and the Ghostbusters would be called up by them because they would be the ones who um, encounter these ghosts um, who are attacking them or ruining their plans to terraform the moon. So I guess the ghosts could be alien in nature because I, they are from the moon. I guess they could be somewhat human-like. Um, they could also be um, just weird-looking dragon-like even. Um, Serpent-like, I guess, would be another way to put that. Um, but I, uh, think that'd be a cool idea. I just wanted to expound on that because I kind of lost my head for a second. I just talked about Ghostbusters in that film. I didn't mention Star Trek at the beginning, but then I, uh, failed to mention Star Trek characters in the rest of my explanation for the cross, yeah, for the crossover, um, where the two franchises, uh, not films, as I stated, but the other video to crossover. So the Ghostbusters go to space, which matches Dan Aykroyd's original script, which was canceled. And then you have um, three 
original series Star Trek organization characters who are perhaps a subsidiary of NASA or a um, company, space exploration company external to NASA, but they're called in by NASA to help them terraform the moon. And yeah, I think that'd be a good explanation for how those two franchises get crossed over and how uh, those characters can be used. Um, because I think Star Trek is in set in the original series is like 23, 23, 23 or something like that. The original series, so maybe set it at like 22.99. So maybe have it not like the great grandson, but maybe Paul Rudd's uh, great 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 grandson or something around there um, as the character for the um, main leader of the Ghostbusters. Um, so that'd be cool. Um, so that's it. I just wanted to uh, expound a bit more because the other video um, failed um, to mention that. Um, so apologies. I just really forgot the other franchise there. Um, hopefully that makes up for it for this video. Um, thank you for listening. I hope you have a good rest of the day. Uh, thank you for watching too. And have a good rest of the day. Oh, feel free to like and subscribe. Feel free to comment. And that's it. Uh, thank you again. Uh, appreciate everyone who is watching uh, the videos. Uh, so thank you and have a good day. So this is my idea for um, a Ghostbusters and Star Trek film. I think it would be interesting if these two films crossed over because initially Ghostbusters was supposed to be set in space based off of an early script by Dan Aykroyd. So I think it'd be cool if maybe they took the new Ghostbusters, Paul Rudd, and then whoever else they include in the new movies, uh, possibly the uh, children in the new movies. I don't know if that's who they'll use. Um, but maybe the Ghostbusters have um, expanded so much that they now have the power and the resources to go to space. Um, obviously, it'd be set in the future, but um, so maybe not the Paul Rudd character, maybe even a generation or two beyond Paul Rudd. Um, we could use Paul Rudd still. You could just say that Paul Rudd's great great grandson or great grandson. Um, or even grandson is a um, just a very similar looking character to Paul Rudd's character in the Afterlife films. So yeah, I think that'd be really cool. Um, that was off of an initial script by Dan Aykroyd, but um, they decided to put the characters in New York City for the film, which I thought worked better. I think the special effects weren't quite good enough in the 80s to put it in, in space. But um, so I, I think they made a good decision there. Um, but yeah, I think that'd be cool. Um, so maybe after Ghostbusters Afterlife 2, maybe even 3, you can move on to a new series where they're um, maybe on the moon, um, you know, part of SLS and Artemis, and um, they're on this new moon colony where people are, are starting to terraform the moon and create hydrogen fuel from the water they find. And, um, you know, they, they're... Uh, Trying to use um, whatever resources they can, um, like free, uh, potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphorus, and all that. But anyway, they're on the moon, they're terraforming, and um, they have the Ghostbusters up there uh, because they've encountered whoever first terraforming up there, um, ghosts on the moon. So, um, that's why they're called up. Um, the Ghostbusters aren't up there initially. They're called from Earth, so they're brought up to the moon, and then they fight ghosts on the moon. So I don't know. I mean, that's sort of just a simple idea, just a change of setting. But I think that'd be cool because it's based off of that initial script. It'd be a cool new setting for the Ghostbusters. Um, and yeah, that'd be cool to see in the future if they, if they uh, ever make that. Um, um, the Iron Reitman. And this Jason Reitman. Jason Reitman uh, could make that. Um, so yeah, uh, that's just my really simple idea, but I uh, just want to put it out there. Um, so thank you. Oh, by the way, I'm at my uh, parents' house. Um, so that's why the setting is different. That's why I have a shirt on because they actually have air conditioning in uh, my apartment. They only have a house like a fan. So. Um, but yeah, um, so 
Thank you for listening and watching. Have a good rest of the day. And uh, feel free to like and subscribe and leave comments if you like. Um, so thanks again and have a good day. So I decided to do a YouTube video on an idea that I've had ever since I was a kid, or a child rather, um, probably since I was around, around seven or so. Um, so I saw the new Super Mario Brothers movie, and um, I mean it's obviously for kids, but I thought it was good. Um, Mostly liked it for the graphics, the CGI was really good, the visuals were really stunning, the use of the exuberant colors or full prism um, was really good. Uh, the characters' voices were kind of annoying. Um, I thought they could have set a more adult and serious tone, um, but I think it's a good kid's movie. So yeah, I think when I was a kid I had a more adult type of movie in mind, a more serious type of film. Uh, it'd be a bit darker, it'd be based off of the first three Mario games. I actually know the first uh, five Mario games because it would go from Donkey Kong, the original Donkey Kong on arcade, to Donkey Kong Jr., and then to um, I guess it could include um, Donkey Kong 3 a bit, uh, but I don't think I would do that. So Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., um, the Arcade Mario Brothers, and then um, Super Mario Brothers. So the first uh, four games, rather, would be the uh, subject matter for the film. So um, I was thinking that if you show Mario um, when he's first starting out, you could show the events of Donkey Kong, him rescuing Pauline. You could then show him as a villain capturing um, the Donkey Kong who captured Pauline, or Donkey Kong as we know, as we would know them now, uh, or him now. And then um, you show the events of Mario Brothers, Mario and Luigi working in the pipes. And then you'd show the Super Mario Brothers film. Um, well, this, this would be the whole film, but the, the uh, Super Mario Brothers portion would be based on the first Mario game. So you'd have the, the entire film would be based off of Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., Mario, Mario Brothers, and then Super Mario Brothers. So, um, that's my idea, and I think it would take a more, a, a little bit more serious tone, a more adult tone, um, maybe more adult visuals, um, and then um, I think what would be an interesting plot point that I thought of was that at the end, when you show uh, the Mario Brothers you found the Mushroom Kingdom, you should show them rescuing the Toads. And then you show them fighting the final Bowser, um, who isn't an imposter, but um, just one of his um, uh, troops in his uh, form, um, disguised as him, rather. Um, you show Luigi um, sacrificing his own life to save his brother. So Bowser shoots the flame out of his mouth. Luigi jumps in the front of the plane. Luigi is killed. Um, Mario ends up beating Bowser. He jumps over him and uses the axe to uh, cut down the bridge. Um, all while carrying Luigi on his shoulder. He'd obviously have a super mushroom that he saved in his pocket to do that. Um, Luigi would have to be in his normal mode. Um, but then, uh, Okay, so he has Luigi, he saves Princess Peach, and then you show him reviving Luigi with this uh, mushroom that they didn't know 
what it did at first. They just sort of kept it because they were curious about it. Then they, they uh, forced the, the mushroom um, to Luigi, and then he uh, gave his life back. Um, maybe there could be some special thing or section of the film where the one of Mushroom speaks to them and says, don't use me unless you actually need it. Something like that, so they don't just eat the mushroom like they did with the super mushroom, which you find in the film. But, um, yeah, that's my idea for the Mario movie, uh, if you could um, imagine that. Um, just based off of uh, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., Mario Brothers, and then Super Mario Brothers. Um, and that portion, I think, would be a good ending for the film. Um, so yeah, that's just sort of my idea um, for that. Um, so feel free to comment, feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. Um, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a good rest of the day. So this is a video on memory. This is something that I learned about as an undergraduate from my professor, Seth Chin Parker. Um, this was during uh, my cognitive psychology course. Um, so the four basic components of memory you have the visual spatial sketch pad, the phonological loop, the episodic buffer, and the central executive. The visual spatial sketch pad is when the brain receives visual information. The phonological loop is when the visual information, my apologies, is when auditory information is recorded and analyzed. And the episodic buffer is when Episodes of one's past, so for example, a birthday party or opening Christmas presents or one's uh, graduation from high school or one's first car. All of these major events in one's life are considered episodes and the Episodic buffer segments these into various segments so one can remember these in chronological order. So when one was born, which most people don't remember, but that's an example, and then Let's say the next one will be when one graduates kindergarten, when one graduates lower school, high school, college, so on and so forth, when one gets married, when one has a, their first kid. The episodic buffer segments these various life events into segments which one can remember in terms of episodes. Finally, the episodic buffer is, oh, I'm sorry, central executive. So you have the visual spatial sketch pad, which is visual, phonological loop, which is auditory, episodic buffer, which is episodic, major events, and then you yeah, have the central executive, which organizes all of these um, and from my best understanding, delegates uh, each of these uh, three 
parts mentioned into the appropriate parts of the brain. So, visual spatial sketch pad would be a simple lobe. Phonological loop would be temporal lobe. And as for episodic buffer, uh, I'm my assumption would be that would be the frontal lobe, as that requires um, a lot of gray matter energy to segment those significant life events into segments in chronological order. So that's my understanding of memory. If you have any comments, leave them. If you want to like and subscribe, feel free to do that. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a good rest of the day. Majors that I had uh, both social and and psych had a uh, in uh, social science, which was which was a mixed major, and then psych, which was just a, a secondary major to that, and then I majored in uh, sociology or had my concentration in sociology. When I was in grad school. Um, if you're interested in either of these topics, um, fairly middling in terms of difficulty, um, in terms of college and grad school, um, but uh, difficult overall. Sociology um, is essentially a topic which investigates the logic behind people's actions. Um, it tries to be objective about it, tries not to question it, but rather reports on what's happening. Um, in various fields, uh, in sociology, you can talk about anything, essentially. You can talk about uh, distance learning, which is something that I focused on. You can talk about uh, car sharing, or uh, one of my professors, uh, Steve Hoffman, focuses on uh, simulations and he talks about uh, the global perception of Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Um, there's another professor I had, uh, Daniel Schrauber, um, who I think her most recent article is on wage campaigning. She also talked about remote management of uh, various uh, factories and the efficiency of those. She also talked about uh, medical malpractice uh, and different perceptions of Herb's palsy, which is a, a genetic disorder among both conservatives and liberals. Um, so sociology is a field where one can look at a topic and then investigate it deeply and then explain the logic behind it. So if you're into medical sociology, you can explain uh, what the logic is behind current uh, medical insurance policies, uh, as well as medical practices, uh, holistic practices such as acupuncture, as well as the traditional uh, Western practices such as uh, surgery, and uh, yeah, simple checkups and things like that. So, if you're into sociology um, and you're interested in why humans do the things they do, uh, check out Foucault, who gives a really good basic explanation stating that humans do things for power, they do it to gain. Uh, Power, whatever it is that they're doing, uh, whether it's sports or uh, politics or space exploration, what have you. 
And uh, if you're into psychology, um, definitely check out Freud first. He has a good uh, psychoanalysis, which explains uh, why people um, have uh, certain sexual fetishes, certain sexual um, tics. Um, so if you have a cigar that uh, he states that you might have a phallic sort of tendency, you may be homosexual. Um, Young is another psychologist who has dream analysis. Psychology is another really interesting field, not quite as broad as sociology, where you can look into any field and then try to explain the logic behind it. But it's a bit more specific. Um, I, I do know a bit about uh, the different types. There's abnormal psychology, which attempts to explain why people act abnormally. Um, there's also biopsych, which explains how the different parts of the brain act. So the piece form gyrus is responsible for seeing faces. The suprachiasmic nucleus is responsible for uh, keeping track of time. Circadian rhythms. There's the frontal lobe, uh, which is responsible for forward thinking, organizational thinking, thinking about the future, higher level forms of thought. Um, psychology is a really interesting field, also. It deals more with, um, if I were to compare psychology and sociology, sociology explains the logic behind people's actions and looks into various fields and tries to give an ex objective explanation behind why these people are doing the things they do. And then psychology is more about the brain, how the brain works, and the individual. So sociology, you can think of people as a group, and psychology, you can think of as the individual. Um, and I really like thinking about sociology more in the bio sense, how the brain is working, how humans uh, control their brains, how they think. Um, there's various types of psychology, as mentioned, biopsychology explains the different parts of the brain. There's also cognitive psychology, which delves more into um, how memory works, as well as the different shortcuts people use to complete their tasks every day, voyeuristics, chunking. Um, psychology is a really interesting field. Um, there's also Gestalt psychology, which explains how people organize uh, uh, thoughts into different concepts, so how a cat can be a concept, how a TV can be a concept. Um, and then uh, there's also uh, behavioral psychology, which attempts to explain uh, the behavior behind people, uh, specifically uh, in terms of conditioning. So this was negative conditioning, um, so denying people or any other organism, uh, animals, um, as well as positive conditioning, where one will give something to someone to support behavior. So negative conditioning is when one takes away something to um, not reinforce the behavior, and then positive conditioning is when one gives someone something to reinforce the behavior. So that's behavioral psychology. Um, there's a lot more to it. I mean, there's statistics used in both fields, um, which um, some of it is a bit complex, but um, both are used to show trends of how people act and how people uh, act over periods of time. Um, if you're interested in either of these fields, definitely leave a comment or a question, and I'll answer these questions. And um, if you have any... Uh, other uh, comments on what I just said, definitely read one. Feel free to like and subscribe. And thank you for listening. If you, um, again, are interested in sociology and psychology, definitely pursue it as a major.
in college, they're both interesting fields. Thank you for listening. Have a good rest of the day. So I decided to make it right under the barrel of computers Uh, I think I should one that I know first, metal oxide, semiconductor fields, electric transmitters, field effect, field effect transmitters that uh, alternate the current between the base and the brain. That's the most difficult one that I know. Uh, to explain that a bit more, um, the metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors, you have the metal part of it. You have the oxide part of it, you have the semiconductor part of it, so not completely a conductor, not completely an insulator. And the field effect transistor. Okay, so that's my most difficult one I'm just showing off there. Um, so, to explain computing, you have magnetized and demagnetized strips, which create binary. So, if you want to have a pixel on a screen, on that would be magnetized. And then uh, if you want it off, that would, also, that would be uh, demagnetized, which is a zero. So if one is on, you just magnetize, and then demagnetized is zero. So that's the basic uh, behind computing. And then you also have other aspects of it building off the binary. Obviously, you have a bit string of bytes. Eight bits make a byte, and then uh, you have kilo or yeah, kilo, mega, and gigabytes, which are thousand millions and uh, billions of bytes uh, accordingly. Um, so yeah, computing is really interesting. Um, if you're interested in software, uh, Nvidia is a American company that outsources of materials, uh, it's fabulous, uh, at least for some of its materials, but it creates really good uh, gaming laptops, the gaming laptop I have by NVIDIA, which is a software company, but also creates laptops. Um, they have really good um, products uh, based on what I have, I mean I only have one, but uh, the one that I have is good. Um, but yeah, computers have always interested me. If you go back to history of computing, Ada Lovelace and Babbage, you know, Babbage um, and Punch Cars, Ada Lovelace, who is thought to be the first actual programmer of computers or ancient computers, so to speak. You have the development of machines, the back is stuck way back in the middle, uh, or in the middle ages. Um, and then you have the development of the Westinghouse robot, and Newtonia, which was a computer which had female voice and a voice. Uh, so the development of various types of machines based off of this binary system, um, which IBM or International Business business machines made first started with punch cards based off of Babbage, based off of Lovelace with programming and putting information into a machine to extrapolate into a more complex output. Or output that is uh, pieces of newer images and text and sound and so on and so forth. Various electronic uh, frequencies based off of the binary, magnetized, demagnetized, versus metal. Um, being made to trade what we have now. So, you know, the internet, uh, which has the only thing that's in text and sound that I, that I mentioned. So, yeah, I've really got into computing lately. There's other really interesting parts of computing also. I mean, obviously, the integrated circuit and the silicon chip. Developed by Microsoft was really innovative. Um, but yeah, computing is very interesting. You have uh, 
you know, even a television, starting from the cat point, breaks your television to the uh, component, the composite, and desk video, and digital TV, and fiber optics, and ghosting, uh, all based on the, the cosmic magnetic background, which is this uh, static that exists in space, which is uh, some weird electronic signals that come from space. Um, yeah, again, I'm not an expert in the q I don't claim to be one. I'm an aficionado of it. I have a huge Word document where I have a bunch of these different computing terms uh, that are probably based from Wikipedia and other sources onto it. But um, it's really cool. Like, I mean, it's, it's weird how it's just that our modern computers are based off this extrapolation of the binary of these magnetized and demagnetized strips of metal, which is really interesting, just based on these balance electrons and their alignment, which can either create a pixel on screen or uh, doesn't have a pixel on screen. So you have, uh, in terms of video games, I talked a bit about this in another video of mine, but like the development of video games from Pong uh, to Mario, to Mario Brothers, to Sonic the Hedgehog, to Crash Bandicoot, to modern games and uh, seven. So, um, I'm trying to think of what else I know about Wikipedia. I, I'm uh, going to dig back a bit so I can talk about it a bit more. We have uh, in terms of gaming, which is related to computing, uh, we have the uh, cybersphere or omnidirectional uh, treadmill. Uh, Cybersphere was a company which created this treadmill where one can engage in a virtual, virtual reality orb and you can move in different directions in this orb to create movement of your character on, on the screen. Um, so that's cool if you're interested in that. Um, per, uh, what else here? Um, so yeah, the Omnidirectional treadmill by Cybersphere. Um, obviously, you have a video game programming, which I've looked into a bit in terms of like frame rate and uh, just uh, video game design and how one can create different elements of, the, of a video game graphic. So, yeah, frame rates in terms of how much uh, information it is. Pass through a frame in a certain amount of time. Processing power obviously is important, like flash processing, uh, 16 bit, and whatnot. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, just, it's a really interesting development, um, this extrapolation from the binary into what we have now, um, which I think is similar to 28 bit. If you know whether or not 256-bit exists, and I'll research this right after the video also, uh, let me know. Um, I have not heard of 266 bits. But um, I don't know if that's what is in modern games now. I only really know if you're playing in bed games in my seven years here. Um, uh, yeah, computing is interesting. I want to look up some more, um, lectures that talk about, um, how video games are actually programmed in terms of how data is saved, how things are designed, um, frame rates, and graphic design and aliasing, and lighting, shading, all of that. So, uh, I'm going to end the video now because I've reached the limit of my knowledge of computing, but uh, feel free to comment, feel free to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching and have a good rest of the day. So, I decided to do another video on an idea that I mentioned in the video, uh, the most recent one that I posted, uh, where I talked about some uh, 
crossover ideas for characters that I enjoy watching films, uh, Spider Man, Ghostbusters, Daredevil, uh, Super Mario Brothers, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I figure since they all live in New York City, they can all be in have some sort of adventure. But uh, check that video if you're interested in that idea. Um, any claim that has my own, so please don't pass. Uh, steal that and then take people in action against you. Uh, but because uh, I might actually uh, write that someday. So, um, so that's my idea there. Um, but I also have some other ideas I uh, just want to talk about that I talked about briefly in the other one. Uh, so, Batman and Star Wars. Uh, so, again, I'm just brainstorming here in these videos. But I'm trying to think of how Batman could be involved with Star Wars. Because Star Wars is set in a galaxy in another time. Supposedly, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. So, maybe I could do, if I were to write this, I could do where Batman is an alternative Batman universe, which is set in the same time and galaxy as the Star Wars. Uh, maybe he's on a planet called Planet Gotham. That would be really the only way where those characters could be. So, okay, so we have Planet Gotham within the Star Wars galaxy. And I'm trying to figure out how those characters would be motivated to plot that would drive them there. Um, I really would like it to be set during the original film. Is it bad? Times. I really like the other films too, um, but the original three, I would like to be a set during that time. I really like those characters the best. I like that aesthetic the best. I really like how those, excuse me, I'm belching, um, but uh, I like how those films do make use of more tangible special effects. The Muppets, uh, the uh, model ships, uh, all of the different vehicles that are made are not CG, they're all handmade, so I really like that. Maybe that could be incorporated in the film. It could be a no CG film, just uh, old school 80s special effects. Um, that could be really cool to see, I think it would be different and nice change of pace. I like CG too, but I think this would be a cool aspect of that type of film. So you have Planet Gotham, but then Star Wars universe, maybe it's on the outskirts of the galaxy, a planet they never really heard of before, but the characters in it, maybe it could be set between the first and second film, between New Hope and Empire. So it could be where one of the characters, uh, let's say Luke, uh, is just, uh, you know, attempting to fight some of the Imperial forces. Uh, he's ambushed. He doesn't realize how many uh, uh, of Darth Vader's troops are actually uh, at the location he's in. So he's ambushed. He's pushed to the edges of the galaxy. Uh, somehow uh, Han is able to uh, use some of his troops to eventually uh, fend off the uh, Darth Vader's forces who are attacking Luke. Um, so Han uh, comes to his aid, uh, is able to fend them off. Both Han and Luke are then, I guess R2-2, uh, because R2 is part of Luke's ship, they end up uh, landing on uh, the planet Gotham, which they've never heard of. It's sort of on the outskirts of the galaxy they're in. Um, Maybe even within another galaxy, uh, sort of on the edge of uh, the Gotham galaxy, maybe, and then the uh, Star Wars galaxy. So, Han and Luke end up landing on this planet, and they search around. It seems to be an ecumenopolis of sorts, or a planet that is. A city for all of it. There's no nature, there's no trees or grass, it's just one giant 
city with buildings and concrete. And I think it would be cool if it was a futuristic um, Gotham, uh, one that was, um, and it's set during this time that Star Wars is in, which is in the past, but Star Wars is more futuristic. So maybe have a futuristic uh, Gotham set in the past in this galaxy. So Han and R2 and uh, Luke are all on this planet, uh, planet Gotham. Um, they meet the denizens there, all are um, sort of sour. Um, there seems to be a lot of crime on this planet. Um, and then um, as they're walking around this planet, um, as they're waiting for, let's say the reason that they're stuck on this planet is because their fuel has run out in their vehicles. So they contact Leia, they say we need someone to uh, pick us up. So that's why they're on this planet now, it's taking some time for Leia to find, um, you know, uh, troops, the rebel troops, uh, to get fuel to them. So that's why they're stuck on planet Gotham for a while. So they're all walking around there. They find out there's a lot of crime, uh, a lot of deviants, the people are all sort of uh, sour, melancholy, not very cheerful. Uh, so I'm trying to think, of how would they first encounter Batman? Um, I suppose it would be more interesting if they encountered one of the villain villains first. Uh, Joker's been trying to over the years. I'm trying to think of a good one. Penguin might be a good one for this one. Um, because he um, is high level, but not as high level as Joker. So let's make it the Penguin. Oh, uh, Penguin uh, robs a bank, let's say. Uh, and the Star Wars characters, Luke and R2, and Han what is this happening? So they try to intervene, um, they try to stop Penguin's forces. Um, Batman arrives on the scene also, um, as he's been tracking Penguin for a while, and he's learned of this bank robbery that's taking place. Um, unfortunately, because the Star Wars characters have intervened, um, they uh, sort of ruined Batman's plan to capture Penguin at this bank robbery. And uh, Penguin escapes. Uh, so Batman tells them who he is, how, he, how these characters have ruined the plan. The characters apologize deeply and say that they're trying to help. Uh, Batman tells them uh, to stay out of his business and that it would be best for them just to um, wait for their ship and you know, not get involved in what he's doing. So we have that there, and the movie can't be all about them just waiting, you know, in a cafe in Gotham City for their fuel to arrive. Um, something else has to happen. So um, perhaps um, we'll put another villain involved, although that might be a good idea. Um, maybe they, as they're waiting, maybe they are in a cafe or a bar in Gotham. And they end up meeting. I'm trying to think of another good Batman villain. Ripper has been used recently. Maybe the um, French Lucas character, the puppeteer person. I'm blanking on his name. I don't know if there's. I'm thinking it's an Antrilopus. Uh, who was his name? Um, um, Google now. Antrilopus villain. Arnold Wester, Incarnation of the French Wolfquist, and Scarface here in the Batman Wolf, which my name is one of them. Okay, so it is a good one, because I was correct on that. Um, okay, so let's say they meet uh, the Trilloquist, and he's in the bar also. He has this uh, dummy who he's talking to. The Star Wars characters are intrigued by this. They approach him and ask him if this is like an act that he does. Um, the Ritualist states yes. And uh, if they're interested in seeing one of his acts, acts, they say they're stuck on the planet for a while, so why not? 
Coach Volko says, great, I have an act tonight at this bar later on, uh, you know, at 10 p.m. Feel free to stop by. Um, so, yeah, okay, so we have that. Uh, so uh, we can obviously cut to the scenes with other Star Wars characters also, and Batman, Batman doing investigative uh, uh, work in his back cave on his computer, uh, trying to search for henchmen who uh, he can track down and see what the penguin is and what he plans to do next. Um, we can also cut back to Leia and the other Star Wars characters on their Rebel home base, and they can, you know, discuss, you know, where their Rebel troops are, what the fuel situation is. Uh, Scene Rikyo and Leia, uh, not Lando yet, because he's not in the movie's civil empire. Uh, Leia and Rikyo would be maybe discussing this. So, that's the plot as of now. Um, and then, I think what would happen is that the characters see the show by the Ventrophus. The Ventrophus ends up taking the bar for hostage and taking whatever uh, money is in the characters, all the people in that bar's pockets, any money they have, um, as well as money in the cash register at the bar. Um, the uh, Ventrophus ends up getting away. Um, and i trying to think of how, what would happen for Batman and the Star Wars characters to meet again. Maybe they, um, the uh, Metropolis also steers the Star Wars, steals the Star Wars characters' weapons and R2 also. And they need R2 for Luke to get home because he's part of his uh, computers, or ship's computer system. So they try to figure out uh, how to track down Batman. They don't know who he is or where he is. Um, but I think what they can do is they can um, search the city. They walk around the city. Um, they try to track down Batman to help them um, find their control books. I think the most likely scenario would be that they just find Batman um, via Commissioner Gordon because they go through the police and to state that um, you know their weapons and R2 was stolen and then they uh, try to see if the police can help them with this. The police state that um, they can but express that you know, they're sort of tight thin because there's a lot of crime going on. So they think, well, the police aren't probably going to help us, so we should probably get involved with the Batman character, although he doesn't like us, he seems to be angry at us. So, um, they ask Gordon where Batman is. Uh, Gordon doesn't know either, but he says he can contact them with the bat signal. So, um, they contact him with the bat signal. Batman arrives at the, you know, top of the building where they could be, um, or where they would be, along with, uh, Han and and then Harlem would tell him what happened. Batman states that he'll help them find the Ventral Quest in R2. So um, Batman, um, I think it would be best for Batman to bring them to his uh, lair. Maybe he can uh, put a blindfold over both of their eyes and then to uh, hide his location. So that would be good. And then he can. Uh, do investigative work on the computer. Um, he finds out where um, some of where the ventriloquists would most likely be, um, based on some other data he's collected from him, maybe some DNA um, that he's used to, you know, his tracks throughout the city and uh, can find them that way. Um, so yeah, that'd be cool. And then I think eventually what happened is Batman finds a control quest, um, but he um, also finds Penguin there also because the control quest had plans to um, team with the Penguin also. So Batman and Han and Luke all meet to the control quest and Penguin at um, whatever headquarters they're using for their crime. And then they, uh, I guess they could fight, I suppose.
of um, but then they retrieve uh, R2, Leia and C3PO eventually arrive with fuel. Uh, they all, you know, thank each other for their assistance, and that would be the end of the movie. Um, so that's the idea that I just brainstormed right now. Um, I think that'd be cool. And then um, Samus and Spider Man. I think that'd be another cool crossover. Again, they're sort of in different universes, but. Um, there is a uh, Madam Web in the Spider-Man animated series from the 90s, and obviously there's the multiverse. So Spider-Man um, is not a stranger to traveling to other dimensions. So maybe the plot for that could be um, Spider-Man is trying to track down, um, you know, one of his villains who I don't want to use Rob the Mac again, but maybe he's trying to track down. Um, Let's say the second Green Goblin who has uh, kidnapped Mary Jane and he's attempting to track him down. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Madam Webb is experiencing a technical difficulty with her dimensional machine. She ends up opening a portal as in the same location where Spider Man and Green Goblin and Mary Jane are all in the air, you know, swinging and fighting. Some sort of malfunction with that portal machine, that portal machine opens up at that moment in time, ends up capturing all those characters, um, including Madam Web, and um, they're accidentally transported to Samus' dimension. And um, so they find themselves, uh, all these characters, on uh, one of the planets in Samus's world. I don't know the which one. Um, I don't know this very well, but it's one of them. Um, they end up encountering uh, Samus during uh, one of her fights to catch a bounty hunter. Um, they end up ruining her bounty. Uh, the bounty gets away. Kind of similar to the other that they fought. Um, so I apologize for this, but. Uh, the bounty gets away, Samus expresses, you know, her dismay. Um, once again, similar to the Batman plot tells the characters to stay out of their business out of her business. Um, the characters talk to Madame Webb, uh, Samus just sort of leaves at that point to find her bounty. Um, the characters talk to Madame Webb, they try to figure out how long it will take her to fix her um, you know, I don't know if it's a machine, but I, I think it is her uh, Dimensional transportation machine. She says it's going to take a while, so she is going to fix that there. Um, Spider Man and Gabi, the Green Goblin to Harry, have to sort of come to terms um, with each other to cooperate. Um, and then I would like, obviously, uh, Spider Man and Gabi. Oh, you know what? I think it's a better idea. Gabi says, Screw this, grabs Mary Jane again, Spider-Man tries to stop him, Gabby kicks him away, flies off on his glider, and just sort of uh, flies through the planet that Samus is on. So he eventually catches up Green Goblin to uh, Harry and Mary Jane with Samus's ship. Um, he sees him, Spidey is also just running after him at this point, because there's no, nothing to swing from, so he's just sort of running between him. To catch him, which I think would be cool and unique to usually see Spider Man swinging. But I think this would be cool to set up some sort of like a uh, desert planet, like an arid planet, so there's not a lot of. Uh, I mean, you could swing from some things, but not a lot for Spider to swing from. So, anyway, we have Green Goblin, Two, and Mary Jane. They catch up with Samus' ship, who's chasing this bounty hunter who's right ahead of her, also. Uh, they end up, uh, you know, sort of flying next to each other. Spider-Man is close behind them. Um, and then, what would be best next? Uh, I think it would be best if uh, Spider-Man grabs on the Gabi, ends up crashing Gabi into Samus' ship, knocking her off course, 
and once again the bounty gets away. So they both they all crash on the ground. Um, once again they have to speak with each other. Samus is really sick at this point. That's the second time they've ruined her bounty. Um, she stays, you know, sad about this and whatnot. Um, I'm trying to think of what else would happen. I don't just want that same scenario to happen over and over again. So, oh, you know what would be interesting at this point? Um, Adam Webb um, transports to that location where they're all at at that point. And she says, um, the transportation machine is fixed. I can return us all to New York City. Um, and uh, so she does this. She presses the transportation button. Um, but something malfunctions again where Samus is flown away at this point, but the transportation uh, board that emerges becomes super large, and Madame Webb expressed concern over this. She said, why is this becoming so large? It's malfunctioning again, so the character is like, oh great, it's happening again, so where are we going to go now? Ends up capturing Samus and her ship. Ends up bringing Samus and the other characters back to New York City, the Spider-Man universe. So Samus is now in New York City, um, and uh, so once again, uh, they end up landing on the ground. Um, the Greek Goblin quick grabs Mary Jane again. A Spidey tries to stop her. A Green Goblin swats Spidey away, or punches him, whatever, in the way. Ends up flying off Mary Jane again. Um, Samus, uh, you know, asks Madam Web uh, how she can return to her universe. The I guess it. So this is another video I'm making. I was watching uh, James Mike Mondays uh, after I applied to a bunch of jobs today, um, and uh, I Described as a strong character, not quite as strong as Chucky Long, but still strong. Um, but, uh, uh, oh, Robin Robertson. Yeah, I think he's in that also. So a lot of the characters are in there. Um, the main caveat I would give uh, for those of you who are going into it uh, for the first time in the 70s live action show, uh, the supervillains uh, that you usually find in the Spider-Man media are not in there. He's essentially fighting just... This video is on the Mega Man series. Uh, Mega Pressure and platformer game. Uh, your main attack is a pulse beam, not a laser, but a pulse beam energy beam. It's like a pellet of energy that gets the gun and then it gets switched to his hand. I might be the same with your life's antagonist. Um, an evil scientist, so to speak. I don't remember what the plot for TV services on their uh, text based uh, service, uh, or chat based service, rather. So, customers would send in uh, questions uh, about their TV service, maybe a chat or an actual video. We're going to do another video here. Um, it's very similar to your watch family guy in the past. Um, 
one of the episodes, a bit earlier on, he has a segment called, What Crimes Might You? cereal, which was discontinued in the 90s, I will eat it. It is a great cereal. It is made of rice, corn, and wheat. It has three different strains for the different Rice Krispie-like cereal pieces, and I greatly enjoy it. Please remake triple cereal. Um, I would greatly enjoy the cereal, and I uh, I would definitely eat it for breakfast every morning. And uh, I have been by your factory in Buffalo. And I enjoy the rest of your products. And if you remake the triple cereal, I will also buy a triples t shirt, which you should also make. And then I will walk around my town with the triple cereal t shirt on. Because I miss your cereal and I wish uh, your company would remake triples. Uh, your best cereal. Uh, so thank you for listening, General Mills, um, and I uh, hope you have a, a good day. Uh, feel free to like and subscribe, leave a comment. Um, my name is Stephen Lancaster. Uh, thanks again for listening and watching. Uh, have a good rest of the day. So I decided to do one more video today. This is about copyright restriction on YouTube. Uh, I'm all for giving credit to the artist who deserves credit. So if you make something and you put something in your video that belongs to someone else, always credit them. Uh, but I was reading the copyright laws today regarding public domain. And as of 1978, the life for public domain is either 70 years from the author's death or 95 years from the year it was first published. When I read that, I was thinking, 95 years, that seemed like a really long time. And I was looking at some of my own stuff, which has been restricted due to copyright. I've written some notes in the detail sections of those videos, basically stating what I'm stating in this video also. Um, a little more info regarding those actual videos and trying to state why I should uh, not be... Uh, Subject to copyright uh, restrictions on those. Uh, some are partial, some are one is completely uh, copyright restricted, and two are partial. So I do mention in those videos what material we use. I do try to credit the artists that we borrow from more in order to do that uh, in the details section. So if you're a a YouTuber like me who is getting copyright restricted that may help, I don't know. I was originally going to dispute these, but I read that there is a possibility if you dispute these, um, your YouTube channel can be shut down. So I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to dispute them, um, at least yet. Um, I may not even have to. They may they, um, release the uh, restrictions, so I don't know how to wait, but... Uh, and again, I'm not using the site to get money. Um, I might someday. I don't know yet, but I may. Um, but it's just so strange that that public domain is 95 years after the author dies, or 70 years after. I'm sorry, 70 years after the author dies, or 95 years after the uh, work was first uh, released or published. So. A lot of the material that I'm getting restricted for is only a bit over 20 years old. So I'm thinking about public domain, and I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, potentially making money off these videos. And I thought, maybe I should suggest that the public domain be 20 years um, after someone publishes a work. Because if you make a work uh, of art, and publish it, um, either you post it on YouTube, or you actually, you know, publish a book, or create a film that gets released from Hollywood, or by Hollywood, then, I mean, 
seriously, are you really going to scour, you know, 95 years later to get money from them? And the families too? That seems a bit insane to me. Um, I, I consider myself, and I obviously would fall under this law also, so I'd be subject to it too. Um, but, you know, if I create a work and then 20 years, goes, 20 years go by and I don't gain any profit from it, I don't think I'm going to gain profit from that work after 20 years. I think that seems like a long enough time. So, 20 years, that's what I consider to be a reasonable length of time for public domain. After your first edition release the work, after 20 years, uh, anybody should be able to use it. I think it will allow for more creativity on YouTube. I think it allows for works that use sectors of works that people enjoy and can pay homage to. I think as long as the YouTuber credits um, the artists that they have taken parts of these different works from, I think really creative um, videos can be created. Um, so that's my opinion. Um, that's what I think should take place. The 20 year instead of the 70 slash 95 year public domain. I mean, yikes, that seems like a really long time to me. Um, I understand families can benefit from a uh, work that's created by an artist and they can gain money from that. And I do understand that point. But I'm also thinking of myself here, you know, my family, it, they should be able to fend for themselves. I mean, I created the work, not them. So why should they get money from something that I created? They should get a job and create something and get their own money and earn it themselves. So anyway, that's just the craziness that I was reading about today. Uh, at least what I consider to be crazy. And I will stick to this. I think this is a more reasonable length of time for public domain and how long it worked to be, um, you know, uh, able to claim public uh, not a public domain, but they want to claim copyright over their work. Um, but anyway, uh, 20 years, that's what I'm sticking to. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe. Feel free to leave a comment. Um, and if uh, you have any opinions on this, feel free to, to comment on this also. Uh, let me know, you know what your thoughts are. And that's it. Thanks again. Have a good rest of the day. I am going to do one more video today on computer keyboard drawings that I've done in the past. Uh, this is relatively recently from uh, 2021 through 2022. Try to make the image a bit clearer here at that light.
ghosts here. And then I have a skeleton. I had to do that a few times. And this is this board on Halloween. Yeah, it's uh, Halloween of, or October 13th of 2021. So I have a black cat, I have candy corn there, Ashton in the center of that candy corn there. So I apologize for that. Um, I have that base, another base here with some of the fun extra ground for the quickly. That's similar. Um, and I have a hat cake for half birthday. We need harvest and arrow through it. And then I have tiny hat leprechaun and then open ended, open ended ear. Easter record. And I have Bert and Ernie here. Bert and Ernie. And Ernie super wide there. Um, and then that'd be the end of the center. But uh, that's in there. I have a Barbara candy corn here in the center. I think when I copy them from the file that I'm using to make these, I think this was common word. And then I, I popped it for females, so it went off the center for some reason. Just a formatting issue. I have a scorpion here. I'm pointing to with the arrow. Or the cursor, rather. And then my last one here. This is uh, Luigi's hat. So I have that Luigi from the Mario Brothers hat there. It looks like a plan of making other characters. Maybe just their hats in order to release themselves. So. Uh, and that's it. This didn't work out. So, I'm shooting. I apologize for you on that. That's it for now. Um, so, this is just a key, uh, computer keyboard drawing that I did a while ago. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you want to subscribe and like, feel free to do so also. Feel free to leave a comment. And that's it. Thank you again. I hope you have a good rest of the day. I'm going to make one more video for today. I'm going to do the news again. Or the bells and for recent news. This is a from today that I'll be uh, yesterday or a couple days ago. So I read about HoloLens, which is Microsoft's new virtual headset, which looks really cool. Um, and then I also read about the Navy's new Halo missile, um, which also looks really cool. Um, again, I don't know very much about these, but they look cool. And then there is the NASA X plane. Um, so, kind of sounds like the X Men's plane, but that has a short term fuselage as well as a new engine, which allows it to be more eco friendly and it can save on greenhouse uh, carbon emissions now due to that new design. So, I don't remember. All of these, so this is a short one, but I'm doing my best just to relate the news to you from memory. And that's it. Thank you for listening and watching. Uh, feel free to like and subscribe. Feel free to leave a comment. My name is Stephen Lancaster. I hope you have a good rest of the day. I'm going to do one more DVDS commentary. I did one for the two films that I wrote, acted, and directed in.
back in high school, way back in 2005 or 2006. Uh, this one I didn't um, really uh, write or direct. Uh, I did act in it. Um, it was just sort of an idea called uh, Craig Waxman and I had uh, to parody the uh, SNL sketch. Um, or pay homage to it rather would be a better way to put that. I'm just gonna watch the card. So the day, if you do want to leave a comment or like or subscribe, um, feel free to do so. Um, I'm just gonna watch the credits here because I, I think, yeah, that's it for that. I don't think we have any much credit bonus scenes or anything like that. But uh, thanks again, and I hope you have a good rest of the day. So this is another uh, DVD commentary video that I'm making. I'm going to do it on uh, the Vampire film, another film that I uh, wrote, acted, and directed uh, way back in 2000. I think this was actually late 2005, it was during, uh, not during Halloween. Uh, but yeah, I was a uh, sort of young and then uh, 17, uh, as well as the other actors in it there. Um, if I can get it into camera. I'm gonna move a bit closer to the screen here. I'm just like did a bit better job than the last video on Stephen Safari when I did the commentary. Uh, that's a bit better there. So this is the vampire film. I always wanted to make like a Halloween special. Uh, when I was younger, like the, the Simpsons Halloween special. So again, I take a lot, as in Stephen Safari, I borrow a lot from The Simpsons, uh, a lot from Shaun of the Dead, which was big at the time, uh, a bit from Homestar Bar also, which is a cool web cartoon, which I might do a video on Sunday also. It has a lot of uh, pop culture references, uh, weird artwork, but weird artwork, kind of in the flash animation there. But yeah, I kind of uh, borrow from a lot of Uh, have a secret weapon in garlic, but uh, Josh messes up. He doesn't get garlic as I asked him to. He pulls out an uh, onion, which he thinks is an apple. Uh, so it is also wrong. Uh, so I am also upset him once again for not messing things up. So I think Josh sort of does a good one here, but um, I know he's you know, probably sort of an item, but um, I kind of make myself the straight man and him sort of the silly, silly man there. Uh, but we're both sort of similar there. Um, and Ethan, uh, I state that vampires can have sex because when they're blood running through their veins, Ethan uh, expresses dismay at that. Um, Simon explains that we, vampires can have sex um, telepathically, um, and, and a parent shows the sex there. And so we're both very happy about that. Um, give me a thumbs up, and we have a dance party there at the end. Um, we have another fun short film that I made back in high school. Um, I think this is funny as uh, Stephen Safari, a little different in terms of style. It has a horror element to it. It was made during Halloween, so that, that has a uh, Halloween vibe to it there. Um, there's Josh's cat Emma that was just seen. Anna and Ethan. Uh, this is sort of taken from Animal House. Uh, Anna and Ethan attended community college with the intention of um, you know, marrying and whatnot when they dropped out. There's Emma again. Josh and Steve enjoy their vampire powers. Unfortunately, Josh and I lost the money by drinking too much garlic for an apple right now. We must have eaten some garlic and was taking for an apple. Which is kind of reversed that time. But yeah, I did buy some uh, big vampire teeth, which I got for everyone. And Craig did not die. He still survived. So um, kind of like uh, funny Tim there. Um, and there's Craig and. For some reason, you put a picture of him with Tom Cruise. Um, I don't think that wasn't my choice, that was Craig's, but whatever. Um, Simon and Christine now were part of the Joy Vampire family and were featured on the show with Katie Couric. Um, and Katie Couric is now part of the family. And there's Sammy the Squirrel, which Simon mentioned in his news report for DJ Christine there. And so we put that at the end. Uh, sort of silly news there. But that's uh, the Vampire film.
and uh, that's the first one I made. And um, I thank everyone for watching the commentary here, whoever it is. It, uh, probably no one's watching this, but just this is for my own uh, self satisfaction here. Um, so thanks again for watching. I hope uh, you have a good day. Leave a comment if you like. Like and subscribe if you like. And uh, yeah, thank you again for watching. I'm going to make sure that the TV is in frame here. Uh, so there we go. Uh, so I wanted to do like a DVD commentary thing. Uh, the film is essentially about a, I'll pause for a moment here, a uh, documentary filmmaker who is looking at not animals as you can think of, but uh, tigers and lions and bears and whatnot, but high school students in high school. I thought that was kind of a funny idea. It's so making me, uh, my friends, uh, like the animal subjects, they make a documentary film that uh, someone like Steve Irwin, the crocodile, would make. Uh, so hopefully, everyone can see that. So. So much more information that I have access to. You're going to see and learn more about the world and what's going on with people. When I made my trip to Australia, that was like a 24 hour flight, so having a uh, TV was kind of nice. People could watch you know, some documentaries in Australia, learn about uh, you know, the outback and the animals in there and things like that. Um, I guess this is an explosion of uh, electronic information from 88 until I lived in 2009, so I'll say 2005. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm going to thank you for creating these gaming laptops, which are incredibly fast in terms of processing process and power. Weight is, um, they have any sicknesses or anything that could be um, vaccinated or whatnot. That's another good um, innovation in terms of agriculture. Yeah, um, that's just a electric fence sort of program. You have Rexor and Jaguar, which are the technologies that make use of real time kinematics um, in farming. Also, I think those are harvesters. Um, but there's also an innovation in architecture. Um, actually, also is an urban shelf, which makes use uh, of a city that has ranks essentially. You develop a city that wants to make use of this new access to publications, nuclear, uh, maybe patent uh, or maybe cable, whatever it's going to be for there. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, is that for our game. I mean, that's what I know about architecture and agriculture. Uh, what other fields there have been innovations in? Um, obviously, everywhere, but um, what do I know here? Um, let's see. Uh, I think that's that. Oh, obviously, Greek printing um, is a big innovation, too. That's huge. Um, that's incredible and very. Help us um, interact better socially. Um, it gives us something to look forward to um, after a good working time. Um, what makes one to work more? What kind of makes one to work harder? Um, I think of what else here. Oh, there's another innovation to do too. So we have the Hershey Zero Sugar Chocolate, um, which is something that I talked about. It's not actually zero sugar, it's reduced sugar, but that's still a very good innovation. Uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what else here. Um, there's been a movement in um, art, which uh, the thing about uh, Banksy um, is sort of a big one in the 
2010s, the sort of guerrilla art uh, becoming a, a style, uh, which is cool. Uh, and obviously AI has become huge recently, uh, relatively recently here. Um, chat GPT, uh, mirror image responses, and <coughs> there's also uh, deep learning, which makes use of state action rewards and proximal parity optimization, which is essentially the compression of or reduction of error that one can see in their program. So an example of this that I've uh, seen is with the Spider-Man video game. They test their Spider-Man model and it swings the ability. And what they do is they essentially compress um, uh, the errors and then reduce these errors via trial and error with this uh, model, uh, this Spider-Man model, which can um, swing to the city. And they um, are able to uh, make Spidey's swinging more efficient via this programming of uh, state action reward, PPO, uh, proximal parity, optimization. I'm not an expert on this, so I can't say too much more about it, but that's a really interesting process. Um, if you're interested in that, deep learning and machine learning, uh, AI in general. And I don't think we have to worry, um, if you're worried about AI turning on us, I don't think that's a big worry. There is a worry that the AI can malfunction, but I think we're smart enough to be um, very uh, I think those people are going to make the AI, AI are going to make them very safe. I don't think, I mean, obviously, AI is not organic, so it, it can't develop free will. It's going to do what it's programmed to do. That's how, that's what defines artificial intelligence. So, it, I, there is a danger of it malfunctioning and potentially hurting us, but it's not like it's going to develop in free will and then rebel against you. It's, there might be a malfunction. function, it might shut down, um, but I don't think there's, I, I, there's no worry about, you know, a matrix scenario where all the machines uh, turn against us and put us into pods. But, uh, I uh, AI is huge now too, um, and looking at that a bit myself. Um, but um, I, I think it was, I think that's about it for now. Um, I keep saying that, and I keep thinking about things that um, I've read into, and then, uh, but like I said, I really did not think of much else. Um, I'm trying to think of how. Um, Comedy has changed, like how a film has changed in terms of like comedic films as well as stand up comedy. Um, it seems to be a bit more. I'm trying to think of how comedy has evolved since the 80s and the 90s. Obviously, you have the observational comedy, which is big in the 90s, um, but then it sort of transitioned to sort of alternative comedy where people just start talking more about their lives. Try to associate more with the audience, um, but then there's also other comedians who incorporate uh, audience interaction, uh, like Matt Malcolm in his recent specials, um, sort of focus on the audience through the interaction also, so that has evolved also. This comedy in general um, seems like a good huge in this field, and um, he's probably the most innovative person I can think of in terms of comedy. Um, he just creates uh, so many different shows where he explores different topics, um, ranging anywhere from looking fun at middle America, looking fun at um, false territory secretary. Um, I'm trying to think of what else here that he sort of looks fun at and critiques in his comedy. Um, so it's just sort of janky and fun and silly. It's also good to sort of uh, move around, which is also cool. Um, but, uh, he has a nice balance of that. He's very good at critiquing things and providing uh, helpful criticism and humorous criticism also. That's a bit, um, hmm, I don't want to say hidden, but sort of veiled. Um, but that is interesting also. Um, he's very innovative, 
Harry and Olympic also. He still had a really good one with office hours. I'm glad he's still discussing his politics. Um, kind of shows you and what's going on in that realm. Um, but uh, I think politics is interesting because um, there's been a lot of change in that too. Um, obviously, as our technology changes, our politics are going to change also. Um, but yeah, um, I think I am going to end this scene. Oh, uh, we've got a lot of different beers in the house also, so I'll end with beers simply here. A lot more craft beers, I mean, a ton of craft beers in there, which is really cool. I don't drink quite as much as when I was younger, even by the 20s when I first started drinking. Um, I was actually 19, but, um, even since then, there's just been this explosion of craft beers, the amount of flat craft beers, the different flavors to them. Um, it's been awesome. And, yeah, I guess I'll end with that. So, um, <laughs> obviously, uh, not the most important innovation, but, um, uh, an important one. So thanks for listening. Uh, feel free to comment, like, and subscribe, and I hope you have a good rest of the day. So this is another attempt at relaying the news for the day. Um, I had another video that I posted earlier, um, but I didn't think it was very good, so I'm going to try another one. Follow the directions of the Easter eggs you find to find a special surprise. Okay. It says, go to your bathroom. Uh, this is weird because we're freaked out. To be honest, um, Anyway, I'll, I'll keep trying to the news here. Uh, my thought is that the robot that flies a plane um, has the Raspberry Pi, which is a large, uh, well, a small computer. Oh, there is one right here, so someone's got my house with the X in my house. Um, so, I forgot that this is here. I don't know, my question is called police. Uh, no. uh, shower. In the apartment. Uh, I guess I should have panicked quicker than that. I don't know why I wasn't alarmed by the first thing as much, uh, but I did search the whole apartment and no one's in here, so I don't know where the heck these things are first coming from, but uh, I'm going to open this one here. Okay, it just says go to the kitchen and walk to the car. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, I'm going to just keep attempting the news here. Um, so, you're going to have the Raspberry Pi, which is a small computer. Uh, you can put this up here. Um, anyway, so the uh, Raspberry Pi is a small computer that has the large version of it, the large LED light. Um, I'm going to put another egg. Um, so, someone got my house. 
last year. I may have to file a police report on that this video here because I don't know what exactly this person had in here. And this doesn't look like any of the handwriting of any of my family members or my friends. So um, I'm going to have to uh, possibly do that. Uh, I'm just looking across the other yeah, one, this one, and the one this red. Okay, that's something on here. Um, look in the cashew. something in her fish. Uh, I don't know if that's right. Uh, right now. Uh, but I, this says uh, look in the box of the seat. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm looking around this area. I don't seem to be watching you right now. Five sign there. That's my age. Uh, and there's another. Oh, there's a chocolate chip muffin. I do like those. Um, let's see what's on the egg here. Uh, so no toe, no heads. So that's good. Um, happy birthday from the birthday bunny. Uh, someone got into my apartment somehow when I was sleeping and left these eggs. It might be probably their family member, but they might have just changed their handwriting on there. But, uh, let's try it here. I'm going to, I guess I'm not going to be concerned that there's poison in here. Um, it smells normal. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I have the uh, pie bat and then the raspberry pie and then solid nines, um, new PCID, peripheral component, interconnected express SSD, uh, or solid state drive. Um,
I'm just kidding. I'm not actually dead. Uh, that's just a joke for you guys. It's my birthday. So happy 35th birthday to me. And uh, again, nobody broke in my house or anything. I said this egg. So everything is safe. Um, I'm good. Uh, just a joke for you that I did. Uh, so anyway, again, happy birthday to me. video is a more general talk so the video games have played in the past. It will be as in-depth as some of the video game franchises I made videos about recently, some of which I'm still uploading, um, so hopefully that will be up soon. Uh, I uh, really like Steam. Uh, Steam has some good old game collections on there. Atari Vault, Nintendo Museum, Archives Volume 1, Sega uh, Mega Drive, and Genesis Classics. Uh, all of them are good. As a kid, I played uh, a lot of Sega Genesis, uh, with some games that I liked on there. I liked all the Sonic games already, but Sonic Knuckles and Jerry and Knuckles. Uh, so you can that too. Toe Jam and Earl, 1 and 2. Earth Jam 1 and 2. Uh, Man 1 and 2. Also really good games. Uh, check those out if you have a chance. They should, I think they're on the Sega Mega Drive and Genesis Classics. Uh, uh, I'm not even sure possible about those there. And then PC games I played, um, not a whole lot. When I was a kid, I played uh, one Mini Maker game, which I played the other day, bro. Another kid detective game, which was really good, very educational. Um, kind of a crossword puzzle to solve that. And One where a guy kind of flips out because he uh, is disgruntled because he didn't get a chance to work on the actual play sets. Uh, he was just working on the computer and portion of it. And he just they share the game and he's like, gosh, I'm doing all that stuff. So it's kind of funny. Um, anyway, um, Army Point is another game by a guy named Old Power PC, which I also played similar to The Neverhood, um, but I could not beat that one. It's been a while since I played that. I don't think I've actually played that since. Uh, I haven't played that since college, but uh, so I'm trying to check here. So Chris, uh, Chris Hill, and then just the uh, email. Shaven. Okay, so Shaven Alomar is the other character who's in the game. Um, so that's because uh, they added the character, added the new setting. Um, I believe it is the um, Las Plagas again, who are in the RE5. As they are uh, more intelligent, they aren't just the slow moving bio uh, weapons that you find in the uh, first three. Um, although the uh, first three does have the nemesis creature who is intelligent and super strong and large and uh, tall. And he's uh, difficult to defeat. So there um, are um, intelligent or more intelligent enemies in the first three games also. Um, so I just like Bogus at four and, and five. I really like how all of the games um, make use of the typewriter, or at least the first three games do. Uh, that makes it a bit more of a challenge. Uh, I don't mind that they. I uh, don't have those for some of the games also, but that's uh, a good challenge there. And then I uh, always like the use of the herbs and mixing of the herbs to make uh, health remedies. Uh, the first aid spray uh, is also cool. Uh, just really like all the weapons. I personally like the shotguns, there's just something very satisfying about pulling a plaga or a bio weapon away at close range, uh, even if the shots are really bad. Sniping is cool too, I really like the sniping element that are found in the games. Uh, there are really good puzzle elements in the games. Some of which are uh, difficult. 
Uh, it do require a good deal of thinking, uh, and planning, and just a lot of patience. Uh, but they're uh, they are solvable, uh, and uh, they make really good uh, additions to the games also. So I really like how the series sort of mixes uh, action, uh, adventure, suspense, uh, horror. Uh, puzzle solving has good drama in there, and the stories also has an interesting story with uh, complex characters and interactions, and has a good running arc of the story that goes throughout all the series. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's just a really good franchise, it's a really good uh, set of games. Um, okay, so Resident Evil 6, this one I've also played. Uh, I'm trying to remember what makes this one unique. I do remember the first uh, scene where you're, I think, dragging yourself through a parking lot, which is also interesting. Um, I also really like the survival uh, element of these films, uh, what one would do to survive in a situation like this. So then I'm just going to check and see what um, differentiates Resident Evil 6 because. In the first three games, you have the different character viewpoints in the different settings in the mansion, um, as well as the city, and then once you're on the train. Four has the Lost Plagas in Spain, I believe. Um, um, I'm just going to check that. And then Resident Evil 5, yeah, in Spain. And then uh, Resident Evil 5 is in Africa. And then Resident Evil 6, I'm just going to check the location to see if that differs. Uh, it's in America. Okay, so that's in China. So that's cool. They're always changing locations. Also, uh, I really like all the characters. They're very interesting. I like the Leon and Ada Wong uh, dynamic, um, where I think they're both interested in each other, but both have different alternative, um, ulterior motives. Um, uh, all, okay, so six also takes place. In Tall Oaks. Um, this is from IGN. And Tall, Tall Oaks is in the trailer. Especially the view trailer focuses on Tall Oaks. Somewhere in Arachnid City. Also in Lanishan, China. So that's cool that they're making this uh, outbreak global. I think that um, it might have been inspired by World War Z. And that it started off as sort of contained. Um, and uh, you know, some people like that more. They like when a zombie outbreak is more contained than just a, a small town or a city. But I like that they went global. I think that's just a natural progression of the evolution of these games. Um, you just keep it in a small town, and I think it could go even forward. I think it's good that they change locations. I think that it's good that they get a global uh, pandemic. Um, something that we've all dealt with actually like recently. Uh, point here, but uh, I'm glad that COVID is dying. Um, so, um, Resident Evil Revelations uh, 1 and 2 are also very good. Um, I like the characters in those also. I'm trying to remember the pig dude with the beard, uh, brown hair, uh, kind of heavier. Resident, I like him, he's a good sense of humor. Uh, I believe he played. Oh, Resident Evil 6, I should talk about the characters in that. Um, um, yeah, I wonder who over here. I think it is Leon S. Kennedy, um, but I double check. Okay, so playable characters. Resident Evil 6, playable characters. So you can call Leon S. Kennedy, Chris Redfield, Dick Miller, who's new, uh, and Ada Wong. Okay, so 6 is on the way to data. It's cool because there's a non player character in the other games, I believe, but I will check on that. Uh, just one moment. Um, so, Resident Evil games where one can play as Ada. Ada Wong. Oh, she, you can play as her in 4 too, I forgot about that. So, she you can play as her in 2, you can play as her in 4. I think she has a, like that. She's not in the actual game though, she has like a bonus um, kind of side quest you can play as her in. So that's in 4. Uh, I'm just going to check and see where else you can play as her in. Uh, I'm just going to check and see if there's something 
here. Um, so maybe I can get a one. So maybe this one over here. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm just looking for something short and sweet here. What she say? Moose not working in secret. Okay, sure. She has a Peter as a playable character in six also, so make sure the game is two as an NPC and then in 2004 as a playable character. Not in the main story, but um, for some sort of side quest. And then she also has a playable character in Resident Evil 6. So I don't know if there are any other games. She's a playable character. She's interesting to you. I like that dynamic between uh, her and uh, Leon. <coughs> Um, and let's see, here. okay, so, uh, okay, so Revelations 1 and 2, I was trying to find that, uh, they do from here, one from here, I don't know what the name is, uh, here's the first, 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 this guy, uh, you see people are watching, people like you, um, here, um, you have to type in his name, like, if you're looking for him on YouTube, he gave some good stuff on there, he was associated with Vincent the Massacre for a while, um, did the Rumble for your show, and that one they, uh, discussed, uh, movies that they enjoy, uh, but, uh, yeah, that is a good channel, so you'll be able to check him out, and I was a big fan of the Resident Evil series. Uh, but yeah, it was kind of like part of the mission now. Um, it's also an animator and has some that I understand that gives you on his website also. Um, he does do streaming on Twitch also. Um, but he has a YouTube channel as well. So uh, look him up here with my beats. Uh, okay, so part of the mission now, he has to share a lot of time with my online channel. I'm going to just try to look at him. Um, so yeah, uh, I know there's another Resident Evil game which I skipped over, uh, Resident Evil Code of Veronica, which was made in, I think, 2000, which I've watched the cutscenes for, but I never actually played it. I don't know if that's, uh, good or not, but, uh, I will play it someday. Um, so anyway, uh, so I did, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I'm on Revelation 4, and you see now, both are very good. Um, I really like those games. Um, let me check to see where they're set. Uh, just different locations. Uh, I know you're on a beach in one of them, where you have to like scan uh, various dead bioweapons on the beach uh, in order to progress to the next level. So that's an interesting element to see that scanning, uh, which is cool. Let's see, Resident Evil is set. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, or the Queen Zenobia in uh, Inner Room, which is this really weird. Uh, I never really got scared uh, for a Resident Evil game uh, recently, but it doesn't really scare me either. But there's just a really eerie uh, parts that I'll speak of a bit. Uh, in Revelations, when you're on the Queen Zenobia, uh, the ship that you're on, that's before the game is set. As well as. Uh, in the North Place to set mainly in Europe, uh, the North Queens of uh, There are also some other locations in that game too, uh, like the city's ports and so on, but they're also in there. But anyway, I keep going on a tangent here, but um, I'll go back to one of the scary and other people games when I get into the game for one. Uh, I, never, I never really get scared of jump scares anymore. I used to when I was a child, but I don't really kind of more like that. Not jump scares, but more of like the creation of an eerie feeling. And there's a point in Re Resident Evil Revelations where you're on this ship, uh, and like all the other games, uh, it's really dark. Uh, and you're looking around, and you just uh, hear this voice uh, coming from this room, like saying, Mayday, Mayday. And uh, it's just super creepy. And uh, you do end up fighting that uh, bioweapon. The uh, if it in turn to be scary bioweapon was uh, these really unreal form like it's seems like funky mask on the side there and weird lines. Uh, he 
is a top quantity using the top bonds uh, there uh, in that game. But I've heard the things in the mayday uh, file, uh, but it just gives me the chili clips. And I also like to do a about the games also in the future that I've got to uh, record the text, see what's going on in the story, uh, for those who may have turned into bioweapons, but have written down what their experiences are uh, as they're turning or, um, you know, right before they turn, um, as well as, you know, clues to puzzles and, uh, you know, other things that you read um, in the game, which is really good. Um, a lot of readings actually involved in the Resident Evil series. If you, uh, if you want to know about the story and actually beat the game, um, you do have to do a good deal of reading, so that's good. Uh, but anyway, another uh, part of those games that kind of freaked me out um, has to do with reading, and I think it's in the fourth one. I can't remember where this came from, uh, but um, you're reading this text, and it's about. Uh, Someone, I think it's a male who's been a victim. And he's writing down, you know, what his experiences are, what is happening to him. And it's, you know, him writing down his experience as he's transforming into this Bible. And as he writes, you can see the writing being uh, relatively uh, good at first, uh, uh, not like super intelligent, but intelligent. And then as he goes further, you just see him, his writing sort of break down. Uh, Error becomes worse, uh, his punctuation becomes worse, and then uh, he just starts saying, like, you need to make over and over again. Uh, so it's just sort of weird to see that, uh, it's not just clarifying to see that transformation of this character who you don't remember, but uh, transformed from this intelligent uh, person into this uh, vile who, uh, whose only thoughts are. So terrifying, um, but uh, yeah, it's that was really creepy. I'm I don't know which game of that's in, but it is in one of them. I think it's in four, as I've played four the most, um, and that's probably why I remember it. But uh, anyway, uh, Resident Evil Revelations, both one and two, are really good. Again, a lot of different settings in those games. I love how they take place. Um, I say in the description that I read in which different countries and world that was known yet. Uh, I like the different shades of what they all there. Uh, change scenery. Resident Evil 7. I've not been able to play that for some reason. It's not working in Steam. I have watched all the cutscenes though, and it looks like a really good one. Um, it's a bit different uh, from the other ones. Um, again, some of them are first person, where uh, this one is. Um, like, and I believe Resident Evil 8 is also where you don't actually see your character, you just take their point of view. Um, I believe all the other ones are more uh, third person. I mean, it's somewhat, I could say kind of second person, because first person, you wouldn't be able to see your character. And then third person um, is arguable for Resident Evil, because you do see your character and you're controlling them. But you're also behind them all the time. And, I, and usually when I think of third person, I think of like side scrolling. Um, so I don't know, maybe even like Mario 64 and considering all those other games, um, that might be arguable to say that second person. I have read articles on what a second person uh, viewpoint would be, because obviously at first uh, you don't see your character, third you do, but wouldn't third, I mean, couldn't we differentiate the third being, okay, so third is just 2D size growing, and then it's second person. Is when you just see your character from behind the whole time. So maybe Mario and Banjo, you know, for third, I'm sorry, you know, for second for Mario and uh, Banjo Kazooie, but uh, and other games like that because you can turn your character around and you can see them. For the rest of the people, you can never actually see your character's face. So maybe that's second person, not uh, third person. Uh, so that's interesting to sort of talk about that there. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to start describing what the people second. Uh, so yeah, Resident Evil 7 looks really good, I do want to play that, that is first person, which is good, as with 8, which I've played, um, that has um, to mature back more to the original, because you're basically stuck in house with these, uh, not my weapons, but it seems like it has 
uh, characters similar to like Monrose. They still can speak, uh, they still have their intelligence, but they're very pale, and they do have uh, a tendency for violence, and I think when they eat you, uh, or try to eat you, uh, so yeah, uh, I don't know about that one, I don't know if it's Los Plagas or some other strain of the T virus. Uh, they are a bit different from Los Plagas, uh, but not much, they're, they're actually quite similar, I guess you could say that. But yeah, they're, they're similar to Lost Blockers, but anyway, um, I can't speak much on some of them, I guess, uh, yet, but all the cutscenes are really good. Uh, start with your character, you can do losers. Uh, that's more like the first because you're kind of stuck in this house, uh, similar to the mansion. Uh, eight um, is more like four. Uh, you are back in a town, so it's similar to the town. But you uh, are not the second person, it's uh, first person like Sam. And if you play as Ethan, which is the uh, same character, the plot behind it is really good. I like how uh, Chris Redfield is involved, but he's not a playable character, so they get this new character chance to be a protagonist, which is good. I always like new characters and stories. Um, but yeah, uh, so Resident Evil 8 is also really good. Um, I haven't been able to beat it, but maybe I will someday. I'm stuck on that part where um, you're. I'm trying to get. I'm sorry. Use my flashlight there. I don't know what the character's name is. He's that really weird. I know there's like those four bosses the Hyperbird, and then um, that uh, really tall uh, uh, woman or female. And then there's this other guy who's like a frog, kind of. That's the the uh, boss that I'm on right now, and I'm stuck in a part where you have to traverse through those platforms on the water, and you have to um, hold these different levers to allow oneself to raise the different platforms so you can actually go to the next part of the level. But you have to be quick enough where if, if you're not, the platform will sink and you don't know why you're not. Uh, so I'm stuck on that part there. If anybody has any tips on how to use this action? So damnation. Oh, Dev Island was also coming out uh, on the first day, so I checked that out. So I think it, I was wrong. I think the generation is actually the second oldest, and then the other is the oldest. I'm going to check on that. Um, and then uh, that debuted in 2017. So now that is. One in, I think that was 2008 or something around there. Yeah, okay, so I was wrong. Each generation is actually the oldest. So, Each generation came out in 2008. Vendetta 2017. Death Island has not come out yet, so I'm not the one with it. Damnation uh, 2012. So that's uh, the one there. Okay, so the four of those is curious because. Each generation came out in 2008, and then, uh, oh, uh, okay, yeah, the Iron Man, okay, so each generation, 2008, uh, then Damnation 2012, and then 2017, and then the Iron Man, 
over there that goes on to all my goods. Uh, we can actually see from that two guys. Uh, also very good. Uh, but yeah, um, they sort of, uh, branch, like, they're so part of the they can't remember the Resident Evil series again, but they just sort of branch off into different points of time that are not included in the game, so that's always cool to see. Um, points of time where you're going to be really good, uh, in these characters and in the story. Uh, they're all really good, very serious uh, films. Uh, not much humor in them, but uh, I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate about that about the series overall. It's very serious in this film. Probably just for my flash ones, I, I really do apologize for that. Um, but yeah, I really love the series. Uh, great franchise. I think I'll just name this video uh, Resident Evil and other video games because Resident Evil is my favorite franchise. Um, I think it's the best. One out there in terms of video games. Um, so if you haven't played any of those new mobile games, check them out. Um, if you are going to get really scared, um, don't be. They're really not super scary at all. I mean, there are some kind of scares in there. And there's some creepy stuff. But once you start playing, you're gonna get used to it. And, uh, like anything else, um, you know, you just sort of have to to the scariness of it. Um, but it's still very good. Um, and I definitely uh, recommend it. And that's it. So thank you for listening, and hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you also for watching. Uh, and feel free to like and subscribe. You can leave a comment if you wish. And that's it. Uh, so thanks again. Have a good rest of the day. <laughs>
crossfires and college also. I think that's the former reason I heard, but that was the same year. I saw my performance on this. It was really good. Uh, uh, they set and uh, talked about how I just kind of rolled with it. Uh, talks were closed on Sunday because I did on Sunday. I just kind of talked about uh, the heroin use.
to lower iPod save for Halloween, but more to get also. CBS and Mystery, this is a mystery that also, that's also good. They're all good, I'm just going to show you what kind of genre they offer. Um, again, I don't even know what but um, all the rest of them are good. Um, TV Yesterday Quiz. I'm just going to add a bit more to you. Basically, just a quiz show for a lot of questions and answers that are going to be And then TV Yesterday Romance and Letters for Romance. Um, that might be there. This is mostly the time to be a lot of people who are going to be a I talked about this in my video on uh, Robert Kirk Monaghan, but um, he has some of his work uh, on radio shows um, back from this time period that are on YouTube. I think it's been on Teams yesterday also, so if you like the Bonnie video, or if you want to get more of a party, you can find it. He is on here, I believe. I am 95% yesterday sitcoms um I guess that's it for comedy I don't know comedy I guess comedy like these stand up comedians so I apologize for that that is different so these are the sitcoms and I've listened to people also that are going to be sitcoms which are good if yesterday's industry I've also listened to those are good too um they just talk about um different historical figures and historical events I need to watch I don't know watch I need to listen to these a bit more but um also good. Yesterday, Variety I haven't listened to these yet. Uh, those two variety shows, but uh, I'm going to listen to them Sunday. Tuesday, yesterday, Western. Um, these are good too. I've listened to some of these also. Really good. Um, I can see that here. Uh, these might be new. They're also pretty new again, right? This year. Tuesday, yesterday, Collection. And then TV yesterday, Lord to Suspense. So, I'm not going to take a look at these yet. I don't know what these are. But, let's see. Okay, so this says, Close to Train Us, Nightmare of the Purple Cloud. We like this competition that we just made for the Netflix. So, this seems to be sort of odd problems. Hopefully you can hear this um, in the video. I don't want to see a lot of time in the park and building. That's part of the idea there. He's good. I bet it is his voice. I'm just going to skip this part here. This is how we should have for the Yeah, my other part. 